Acts chapter 6, we're talking about the selection of leaders. Um, selection of servants might be a better way of saying that. Uh, servants who accomplished an important task within the early church. We don't know that they were deacons. Perhaps they were. Uh, they're not specifically called that, although the same word is used in referring to them. But the work that they did is clearly the kind of work that is generally assigned to those who serve as deacons. It at least shows us the process by which the early church went about selecting special servants such as these. If you notice, beginning in Acts chapter 6 and verse 1, in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. And we talked about that the number of the disciples continues to grow it is now being multiplied. Every time you convert someone, if that person will get to work, they will be active in the process of soul winning, uh, then they can convert someone. And so the number can, can grow from one person who's converted to two people, uh, to a hundred people, to a thousand people if they're all working and laboring. Uh, then the potential for growth is astronomical. And we see that in the early church as they're growing, they're multiplying. But with growth comes certain problems. As this congregation grows, there will be certain problems that will come with that. Uh, let me suggest some of them. For example, as this congregation grows, there may be more difficulty finding a pew, finding a place to sit. There may be more difficulty having classroom space for all the children that will be here. There may be difficulty in finding a parking space if this congregation grows. As well, the more people you have, the more problems potentially you can have. Because people bring their own individual uh, kinds of problems with them. Uh, whether they be financial problems, whether they be personal problems, whether they be uh, family problems or marital problems. When you get people, you get problems. That's just the way it is. And we understand that because we have our own share of problems. And the more people you get together, sometimes the, the more conflicts that you can have between people, the more cliques perhaps that can develop in other things. And so we have to understand that growth, although we desire it and although we want it, we have to be prepared for it because it will bring a unique set of problems for us. And we have to be ready to handle uh, those problems or growth will stop or other problems may, uh, may come about. And so that was true of the early church. The early church is growing tremendously. And as it is growing, then there are certain problems that come up. And one of the problems that comes up is, how do you care for all these people? How do you make sure that all these people's needs are being met? How do you make sure that, that no one's being overlooked in this? You know, that's a problem even in a congregation this size. It's a problem sometimes in a visitation program, for example, to make sure that no one gets overlooked. To make sure that if someone is sick, that they get the visits that they need. If someone isn't attending, that they don't merely fall through the cracks, but that we know that they've not been attending. We know that they're in need of encouragement. We know that they're in need of restoration. It's easy for, for some to be neglected. We don't want to do that. Uh, we don't want to be a respecter of persons, because God's not a respecter of persons. And if we're going to be like God, then we too must treat all men fairly. We must always try to treat all men the same. And so we have to be concerned about matters like this. Also, we have to understand that there are some people who naturally are, are going to get more than other people do. And that's not intentional, but let's face it. There are people who have more connections than other people do. There are people in this congregation that, that know everyone in this congregation. Everyone knows them. Everyone loves them. Then there are other members of the congregation who haven't been members as long. Uh, their family history doesn't go back as far as this particular individual or family does. And so they're relative newcomers. They haven't made all the contacts. People don't know them as well. There are some people that are more outgoing than what other people are. There are some people who are, 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 are more prone to visit be involved in helping other people than, than, than some people are. And those people naturally are going to get more attention. They're going to get more visits. The Bible teaches that he that hath friends must show himself what? 
friendly. And if you're friendly, then you're likely to have more friends. And so that, that we know some of that's natural. But at the same time, we do not want anyone to be neglected. We do not need anyone to be overlooked. In fact, sometimes those who are most likely to be overlooked are the ones who need it the most. They're the ones who desire it the most. Other people may be strong enough to overcome being overlooked when and if that happens. But some individuals cannot. And so we need to be aware that these problems can exist. And they did exist in the early church. There was a murmuring that took place. And we talked about murmuring. It goes back a long way. It goes back to the children of Israel in the Old Testament. All the murmuring they did against Moses and against their leaders. And how displeased God was with that. Well, here's the church. Here's spiritual Israel. There's murmuring in it as well. And the murmuring is has a racial overtone to it. It's the Grecians against the Hebrews. Greeks and Hebrews. Now, we've talked about the fact that, that there, there were Jews scattered throughout the world, and there were people who had been converted to Christianity from various places. Well, if you had been converted to Christianity, for example, on the day of Pentecost, but you lived somewhere else, then there might be the desire on your part, and likely would have been the desire on your part, to have relocated to where the church is, to where the church is strong, where the church is growing and prosperous. You might not feel ready to be a missionary in the country where you live, and so you may want to be in the presence of a lot of other Christians. And so you may relocate to Jerusalem or to Palestine, to this area, in order for that to be the case. Certainly it would be the case that if you were a Christian and you were up in years, if you were a Christian and you were a widow, then it would be very likely for you to want to be in a position to where the church uh, could care for you. You would not want to be in a foreign place where Christianity was non-existent. You would not want to be in a place where Christianity was... Um, the numbers were so small that it was persecuted and, and neglected. You would want to be in a place where the church is thriving and growing, where your needs could be Man, that was true of Jews wanting to be in Jerusalem, wanting to be in this area, but it was also true of Christians wanting to be here. And so the concern was that certain widows uh, of a Grecian background were being neglected in the daily administration, that there was some favoritism uh, toward the Hebrew widows. They were getting more than what the Grecian widows were. Their needs were being met, and perhaps some of the Grecian needs uh, were not being met. And so we have this racial divide that is beginning to appear. Something has to be done about it. Uh, the church is growing. The numbers are going up. But what happens if, if a division takes place? The numbers are going to go down. Uh, there, there's going to be a, a problem that exists even in winning the watching world if this division occurs. So it's got to be solved. And the, the apostles are going to go about to solve it, to making sure uh, that this has a, a right resolution to it. The daily administration is the daily handing out of food, the daily handing out of bread or needs. And we've already seen earlier in the context that those that had were willing to sell and willing to give to care for those who didn't. Uh, widows naturally would have fallen in the category of those who didn't have very much. And so they were more dependent. Now the same rules apply that we will see later. The widows that received help were widows indeed. The younger widows were not to be ones uh, that were put upon the daily dole, that were put upon the daily handout of food. That might be a temporary thing, but it should not be a long-term thing for them. They had a way of providing for themselves because of their age and because of their health. They also had, had the greater possibility of being able to marry. Uh, they, they had other ways of taking care <coughs> of their needs and should not be chargeable to the church and also is the case, you do not want to encourage them. The Bible makes this clear. You do not want to encourage them to be idle. You do not want to encourage them to be busy bodies in other men's matters. And if you put them on some type of assistance whereby they don't have to work, they don't need to work, whereby somebody's providing all their needs for them, uh, then the tendency for that goes up. Now, we know that's true in a governmental sense. In fact, we see it in our own country, right? We see it in our own country uh, that there are individuals that are capable of working, but who do not work. Um, sometimes they can make more not working than they can working. 
And so there, there's little encouragement other than just doing the moral thing and doing the right thing and being responsible to go out and find a job because they actually would have less money. They would be in a tighter situation if they did go out and find a job uh, than what they are. And, and so that encourages idleness. It encourages the very things that the Bible is trying to discourage. Well, obviously, uh, the, the church does not want to fall into that model or that mold. It does not want to get into the habit of, of putting people on this type of assistance. Its resources are more limited uh, than what the governments are, uh, plus the fact that that's not what its mission is. That's not what its purpose is. Its mission is to win the world for Christ. Its mission is to evangelize. The number one purpose of the church is not benevolence. Now, benevolence is a part of the work of the church. It is something that we do. We need to do it, but it is not our number one work. It, it, it is not the end that we are seeking. It is, it is something we do because it's something Jesus did. and He's encouraged us to do it. Uh, but sometimes uh, congregations, sometimes churches lose their focus and it becomes, uh, their focus becomes about benevolence. And that's never to be our focus. Our focus is to meet the spiritual needs of men. We only meet their physical needs as a means to that end, to get to helping them with their spiritual needs. And when we lose perspective in that, uh, then, then we have problems. The early church did not lose uh, that perspective. They understood what their number one mission was. In fact, the apostles understand what the number one mission is, right? We're going to give ourselves to the ministry of the Word. We're going to give ourselves to prayer. That, that's what our job is. That's what we need to be doing. Do these widows need to be cared for? Absolutely. But that's not our focus. It's not going to be our focus. We're going to be focused on teaching and preaching God's Word. We're going to be focused on giving the bread of life to people and not merely providing them uh, with, with physical bread. But it's easy. It's easy to lose our perspective in that. Let me make some other points here. It, it is not the work of the church to make house payments for people. It's not the work of the church to make car payments for people. It's not the work of the church to do those kinds of things. Now, do we from time to time do that? Absolutely. But there's caution that has to be exercised there, right? Because when we start doing that, would anyone like for someone to make your house payment for you? I would. You want to make mine next month? I'll sign you up. If you want to make the month after that, I'll sign you up for that too. As long as you want to do it, I'll be glad for you to do that. Why? Because... It's a lot of money, right? It's a financial burden that we bear. Could I be in a position, could you be in a position because of a loss of job, because of health concerns or other issues where I stand in the position of losing my house if a payment isn't made and perhaps someone could make a payment in order for me to be able to get a job, to be able to do that? Well, it's foolish to let a Christian lose his house because you can't make a payment, right? And if we care about people, we love people, we try to come to their aid in a situation like that. That makes sense to do that. But my point is this. That's not the business of the church. And if we allow that to become our business, if we allow our business to be providing food and clothing and shelter and making payments, whether it be a light, light bill or water bill, if we allow that to become our focus... then we've gotten away from what our real mission and purpose is. The Son of Man came to do what? Seek and save the lost. He didn't come to pay light bills or water bills or whatever. Did He care about people? Did He help people? Absolutely. But He didn't come to do those things. He came to seek and save the lost. Why, why did He show the compassion that He did? Why, why did He provide bread for people? Why did He heal people? Well, they needed that. That never was the end that he had. The end that he had was to save their souls. That has to be the end that we have. And we, we have to be concerned. Uh, let's be aware of the fact that there never will be a shortage of hands out. There's never going to be a shortage of those. In fact, you remember what Paul would say in Galatians chapter 2. The poor you have with you always. Paul says there are always going to be poor people. The poor people are never going to go away. They're always going to be here. There's always going to be an abundance of them. 
And so if your mission becomes merely to provide for the poor people, then you're never going to run out of poor people. In fact, to some degree, the more you help, what happens? The more there are to help, right? Because word gets out. You want word to get out. You want word to get out that the South Haven Church of Christ is a caring group of people. And they'll help you if you really need help. You want that, right? But you want it to be, you want it to be for those who stand in need. That you want it to be a positive thing, not a negative thing. You want it to encourage people and help people and not to um, condone um, sometimes the choices, bad choices that people make and encouraging them to continue in that. But here are the Grecians and Hebrews and this difficulty that comes up. The twelve, that's the apostles, Luke uses this expression more than anyone else, called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, it's not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. The situation had grown to the point to where this was going to demand all the time, all the attention of the apostles, and there was something that they needed to be doing more than this. They need to be preaching, they need to be praying, they need to be doing that type of thing. And so they are wise enough to understand there's a need for other people. You remember the Old Testament when Moses, Jethro's father-in-law, gave him some good advice? Moses was literally sitting and judging all day long, judging every case from the smallest case to the biggest case. You remember what Jethro told him? You need some help, Moses. You're wearing away. You're wearing thin. You're, you're, not, you're not going to make it if you keep along this line of doing things. You need to get some men who can handle these. The biggest cases, Jethro says, they can still bring those cases to you. You can render those decisions. But all these little petty things that come out, get some other people to handle that. There are other people that can make those decisions. If there's a big case that no one knows what to do, let them bring it to you. You can solve it. But these other cases, is that not true as well in the work of the church? Is that not what we see here? Are there not other men who can wait on tables and do this? Other than the apostles? Absolutely, there are. And so the wisdom says you select those men to do that and you continue to do the things uh, that need to be done. It says in verse 3, Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. Seven men probably because that's the amount of men would be needed uh, to solve this. Just a, a guess, but more than likely that's the reason why this number was selected. Uh, other cases might have called for less. Other cases might have called for more. But seven men were thought to be uh, enough to accomplish this. Now, there are thousands of people, of course, uh, in the church by this time. We've, we've estimated the number at 20,000. And so uh, that's a lot of work for seven men. But remember, not everyone was a widow. Not everyone fell in this category. And so we don't know exactly what the number of widows would have been. But seven men evidently could handle it. Notice the kind of men that are to be selected. Men of honest report. The Bible places a lot of emphasis upon reputation, doesn't it? Uh, you remember Solomon in the Old Testament said, A good name is rather to be chosen. A lot of emphasis is placed on a good name. Throughout the Bible, we have reference to individuals and the name that they had, the reputation they had. Now, when it comes to selecting elders and deacons, I'm not saying these men are deacons, but I am saying that for the qualifications for elders and deacons, one of the qualifications is they have what? Good report. That They have a good reputation. They have a good name. That's important for those who would lead. That's important for those that would serve. Certainly in a situation like this, where money is going to be handled, where, where their financial resources are going to be handled, they need to be individuals that are honest. Uh, they need to be individuals as well who have some ability when it comes to this type of thing, who have proven themselves. We've talked about before, among the disciples, there was a tax collector. There was one by the name of Matthew who evidently had some ability with numbers. One well, of the early church, there would have been individuals who were businessmen. There would have been individuals who, who, who had some experience with money and knew how to handle it. Uh, and so it is in the church today. We're blessed with people who have those type of abilities and have uh, honest reputation. And here they do. <coughs> Notice we continue. 
full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. They need to be spiritual men. That's what, what it means to be full of the Holy Ghost. You remember in Galatians 6 and verse 1, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one. Restoration is the work of spiritual men. It's the work of men who are filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, to be filled with the Holy Ghost is to be filled with what? It's to be filled with the Word. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly, right? Colossians 3 and verse 16. But the parallel passage, Ephesians 5, 16, says be filled with the Spirit. To be filled with the Spirit is to be filled with the Word. It isn't to say that the Spirit and the Word are the same. They are not. But it is to understand how the Spirit fills us. Christ dwells in our hearts by faith. The Holy Spirit and the Father as well dwell within us by faith. And how does faith come? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Romans 10 and verse 17. And so, to be filled with the Holy Ghost is to be filled with the Word of God. To have a good commanding knowledge of the Scriptures. And these men had that. And, and we see that later on, right? Because two of these men that are mentioned here, Stephen and Philip, are not only serving the church in this way, but what else are they doing? They're preaching, aren't they? They have enough knowledge to be able to go out and teach others, and we're going to see them doing that. And likely, they moved from this work to that work, because at some point, that work became more important than this work did. As they developed their abilities, uh, they went and they did that. A man, notice as well, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. These need to be men who have wisdom. Now, you need wisdom just in life in general, but when you work with people, and especially when you deal with problems, you need wisdom. Now, we've got a problem here. The problem can get bigger. The problem can get smaller. The problem can remain the same. What's going to happen to this problem? Well, that depends upon who's put in charge of solving this problem. Some of you remember a number of years ago when the Chrysler Corporation was all but done. It, it had hit bottom. Who are you going to call in? Who can resurrect this company? It's resurrected today, right? Why is it resurrected? Because Lee Coker, right? Because they called in the right person to handle that problem. He rebuilt it from, from nothing. You look at other problems that exist. Get the right person in charge of it. Something can be done. Put the wrong person in charge with it. And it's over. It's done. Makes all the difference in the world. Here are men who have wisdom. Here are men who not only know the Scriptures, but they know how to use it. Wisdom is how to use the facts that you know. It's how to use the knowledge that you know. There are people who have knowledge, but don't have, have an idea of how to use it. We say they don't have any common sense. They have book sense, but no common sense. Well, that's true. We need people who have common sense. We need people who have wisdom, people who, need to, who know how to apply the information uh, that they have, not merely have memorized it and give it back to you, but actually can comprehend it and, and make applications. If we look at the New Testament, the New Testament is not a book of thou shalt and thou shalt not. That frustrates some people. Because everyone would like for everything to be, thou shalt not do this, or thou shalt do this. But if everything was in the form of a thou shalt and thou shalt not, you couldn't carry this book around, could you? You ever thought about how big this book would be? If everything had to be in the form of a thou shalt and thou shalt not? And so what does the Bible do? The Bible gives us principles. The golden rule, for example, is a principle. Treat others the way you want to be treated. Well, think about how many situations that... How many thou shalts and thou shalt nots does that one simple command cover? It covers a whole lot of negative things. Thou shalt not do this. Why not? Because you don't want people to do that to you. Thou shalt do this because you want people to do those kinds of things for you. You see, that one command covers all... You'd have a book that thick dealing with human relations... Thou shalt and thou shalt not. But the Bible gives you one principle that covers all of that. But you have to know how to take the golden rule and make application of it. The same thing's true of any number of other things. That's where wisdom comes in. James says that if any man lacketh wisdom, let him ask of God. They give it to all men liberally and upbraid or not. You ask God for wisdom. You study your Bible, you get the knowledge you can, then you ask God to give you the ability to use that knowledge that you gain. Now, it is foolishness to sit down and ask God for wisdom if you're unwilling to study your Bible. 
God's not going to do that. God's not going... How would God do that? How would God give you the wisdom to use that which you don't have? You ever thought about that? God, give me wisdom to know what to do in my life. Now, I'm not going to study. I'm not going to put any knowledge in here. And so I want wisdom to, to rule my life even though I don't have anything to draw on. Well, God can't do that. God's not going to do that. You pile your life full of knowledge of His Word and God will help you to use it if you ask Him to. If you ask Him to give you wisdom and you're not willing to do your part, there's nothing to use wisely or foolishly because there's nothing in there. There's no resources from which to draw. These were men who had wisdom. Notice he says, whom we may appoint over the business. Sometimes we complain about running the Lord's church like a business. And I understand what we mean by that, I think. But you remember what Jesus said, I must be about my Father's business. Some men that we may appoint over the business. That, those are Bible terms, right? Right? This is the Lord, this is the Holy Spirit referring to what we do in terms of the business that we are about. There needs to be some organization. There needs to be some order. There, there, need to, there needs to be some financial stewardship. There needs to be some advertising. There needs to be some of these things that are associated with a business in the church. It's foolishness to run away from everything to do with business. Businesses go belly up, don't they? The congregations ever go belly up? Why do businesses go belly up? They're not in the right place. They don't handle their resources well. They're, 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 they're not fiscally responsible. They don't do the advertising they need to do. Those are all reasons why businesses go under. Why do congregations disappear? No one's out advertising. No one's out talking to anybody, encouraging anyone, trying to get anybody to come in. That's why. Because they don't handle their funds. They don't handle their, they don't treat their employees the right way. They don't treat those that make up the organization the right way. What, whatever the reason, the same things happen. And so we have to be aware of that. Notice it says, but we shall give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. There are things in our lives that tend to be what we give ourselves to continually. You know, there are very few things in our lives that only take a very small amount of time. The things that we tend to put in our lives are things that gobble up time, whatever they are. We don't tend to watch just a little bit of TV. If we open the window, we tend to do a lot of it. Whatever it is, we don't tend to do a little bit of golf or a little bit of fishing. If we, if we take it on, we do a lot of it, usually speaking. And if we don't do a lot of it, we don't do any of it. Right? It's just, we, we, we tend to do that in our lives. We tend to do that with spiritual things in our lives as well. We tend to be, if, if we say, I'm going to visit, and we start visiting, we tend to do a lot of it. And, and if we're not doing it, we don't do any of it. There's no, it's, it's, it's hot or cold in, in many senses in our lives with these things. They're, they're going to give themselves continually to prayer, to the ministry of the Word. They're not going to do a little bit of serving and a little bit of praying and a little bit of preaching. No, they're going to do a lot of praying and a lot of preaching and no serving on tables. Because you start serving on tables, you might never get out of that line. You might be there forever. They understood that. They knew what would happen. We have to understand that as well. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and... Parmenas and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. Now, one of the interesting things about all these names is all of these names are Grecian names. Grecian names. Now, where was the problem? Grecian widows being neglected in the daily administration. Perhaps those that were handing out were Hebrews. So at least the appearance was that's the reason why the Grecian widows were being neglected. Now, the problem is on the part of the Grecians feeling like they're neglected. So... What do the twelve do? They say, let's select twelve Grecian men. Not just any Grecian men. Remember, they have to be honest men. They have to be men full of the Holy Ghost, men full of wisdom. 
They have to be those kinds of men. But let's get Grecian men then there can be no arguing over whether or not there's prejudice involved here. Because look, who's handing it out? Grecian men are handing it out. They're not going to neglect the Grecian widows. That's where the problem is. Let's solve it that way. That's what they did. Wisdom in that. Wisdom in doing it that way. We have, we have an expression that a pulling horse can't do what? A pulling horse can't do what? I don't think I made the expression up. Anybody know what it is? A pulling horse can't do what? Can't kick. What, what does that mean? Okay. If you have the horse doing something, busy in something, then you're avoiding a lot of negative behavior just by having them pulling, having them doing something. Here, here are some people that if they're busy in doing something... It's going to be positive. If they're standing around doing nothing, it may be negative. Get them to work. Get them involved. Get them solving these things. You know, when people take ownership of things, they tend not to complain about them. I tend to complain about things that I'm not involved in. If I was involved in it, it would be handled this way. If I was involved in it, it would be getting done. But if I'm involved in something, I'm not likely to complain about it. Because if I complain about it, guess who I'm complaining? I'm complaining about myself. I'm not going to do that. Most of us aren't going to do that. And we don't like for other people to complain about what we're involved in because we're doing the best we know how to do. We're trying. Give me a break. Give me a chance. Don't be so hard on me. Those are our thinking when we're involved in something. These men get involved in it, and so they're not as likely uh, to kick, and and others are not as likely because they, they feel more comfortable that their needs are being met whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. They prayed and make sure they're selecting the right men. They lay hands on them to show their approval of these men. And these men are going to function. The Word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem. There's no division. There's no decrease. It continues to grow up. A great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Think about a great company of the priests. Who would you assume would be the hardest people in the world today to convert? Religious leaders, right? The preacher just down the road here. Because if we convert him, guess what? He's not going to be preaching what he's preaching today down there. In fact, he's going to be out of a job if we convert him. We may find him a job with time as he grows and as he learns the truth, but, but he's going to be out of a job. He obeys the gospel of Jesus Christ. Those are hard people to convert. Hard for them to swallow their pride. Hard for them to say, I've been wrong. I see what I need to do. Uh, We'll pick up here. We didn't get very far, but hopefully we've reinforced at least some of what we're trying to get across here. Thank you for your attention this morning.